Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, we will uh, be giving one or two more minutes for participants to join and, and we'll start quickly. Thank you very much for your patience and thanks for joining. Mayor Araujo, do you have anything to address at the beginning? We usually have Q&A session at the end. Okay, I, I think uh, we, we can we can um, start because um, we will uh, take will take time as well. There, um, Araujo, I, I see your hands raised. Is there anything you want to address at the beginning? If not, we 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 may start uh, and 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 we can have the Q and A session. Um, just uh, for for for. Uh, as in as a, as, a, as a housekeeping, um, first of all, once again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all colleagues uh, joining today's um, uh, 12th uh, webinar of local government and municipal authorities, towards COP26, hosted by ICLE in its capacity as the focal point of uh, LGMA. I'm the director of global advocacy. It's a pleasure to to lead this session, uh, both in terms of uh, a presenter, presenter, but also to facilitate. For those who have attended, uh, they are familiar with our procedures or practices, but for those who join us new, uh, during this one hour, we start with the presentation. Sometimes we have guests. Today's session, we will only have, it will only be me who is presenting. Uh, during the presentation, we mute all participants. And after the like a uh, maximum 40 minutes of, of uh, taking through the agenda, then we are opening the floor. Meanwhile, you can type your uh, inputs or questions to the chat box uh, or, or raise your hands and, and we can uh, unmute you also into in after the session is over. Um, and and these sessions are, are recorded uh, and it is uploaded on the YouTube channel of ICLE. Uh, so we also would like to announce this for your information. And with this, without uh, too much, uh, spending time. Let's go through our agenda. For our agenda today, um, we usually have uh, a recap of, of, of the, the state of art in terms of mechanisms, um, agendas, who is who, and then we usually review what has happened since the last me uh, webinar. Uh, as we said, this is monthly. This is happening monthly. Mm -hmm. For this, uh, which is the first uh, webinar of the year, we thought we may have a recap, recall of, of the, the 2020. Uh, we will take you through the agenda in 2021, and we also would like to uh, share with you our ideas for a, a revision or let's say reloading of the, the roadmap of the LGMA constituency towards COP26 as in a proposal from, from ICLE as a focal point. Uh, so let's uh, start our, our, our agenda. Um, for those um, who wish to listen to the previous uh, webinars over the, the year, uh, since February, we are having these monthly calls and we were delighted over these months to have guests from COP25 and COP26 presidency, the Scottish government, the UNCCD secretariat, um, uh, as well as um, uh, Ralga and, and Glasgow City Council. In that sense, we'd like to thank all of the partners and panelists and in the next couple of months, we also would like to uh, explore additional opportunities so that we enrich our discussions. Uh, the, the session presentations and available, uh, the, the, the links are available, and we also have a YouTube channel where you can access all these previous sessions. Um, for um, a starting point, why uh, are we engaged as local energy in the Paris Climate Agreement? 
because after 20 years of, of advocacy work, we are uh, um, proud that um, the Paris Agreement in its preamble paragraph recognizes the, the importance of engagement of all levels of government. This is a remarkable moment because the UNFCC, the Kyoto Protocol, did not have such a revision. Therefore, we were always trying to make ourselves heard better. Uh, and we were telling to the partners and then the national governments that they can uh, deliver and implement climate policies much better if they engage the local and regional governments in, in spirit of the, the Earth Summit in 1992. Uh, 20 years later, we managed this in the Paris Agreement. How we achieved that, we had uh, made a, an advocacy roadmap, especially since 2009. We have participated in negotiations, made a network of uh, not likely countries, we participated in the, the UN Climate Summit, and we also made ourselves visible in the NASCA platform. Uh, after the Paris Agreement is adopted, we continued uh, for, continue to engage in Marrakesh Partnership as a new mechanism. Uh, as well as um, we have participated in the Talanoa dialogues, we have elevated our, our network of, of national governments to friends of multi-level action, uh, and the, the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco and 2019 Climate Action Summit were again important moments for us. And there, after all these efforts, we now know that in all elements of Paris Agreement, we have a role at local governments. That is making a serious difference because this means that the climate action, which was before Paris Agreement as a, was a voluntary action of local and regional governments, it has become our duty. So we have responsibility in the success or in the implementation of the Paris Climate Agreement. That's why we have to abide ourselves with the goals like 1.5 degree summit, 1.5 degree goals, climate neutrality goals, as well as delivering the spirit of multi-level uh, implementation of the Paris Agreement. Um, so with this in mind, um, what we uh, are also sharing every uh, webinar is the progress in terms of how are we dealing with the leadership of the, the, the climate conference. We know this is a cyclic process. Every year there is a presidency, which is the party who has hosted the summit in the, the year before. Uh, and the, the party who will host the summit or uh, who would be responsible will be the, the incoming presidency. In the case of 2020, mm -hmm. 2021, obviously, um, uh, we have the Chilean government and they are continuing their role, but uh, the, the incoming presidency, they are the ones who have more responsibility in terms of preparing the whole agenda. Therefore, they have now uh, diverse and very dynamic uh, progress. Uh, this chart we are using or updating every month uh, has a new element in the sense that the COP26 presidency, uh, which is led by uh, Right Honorable Alok Sharma, has a, now a new assignment. He's still a member of the cabinet of the UK government, but he doesn't anymore uh, have uh, a responsibility, an additional responsibility on its agenda for as the Secretary of Business, Enterprise and Industrial Strategy. So in throughout 2020, he was hosting or he was keeping these two roles, uh, one as the COP presidency or incoming uh, or president designate, and the other one was business secretary. Now, starting from January 2021, uh, Alok Sharma is appointed as solely uh, the, the standalone um, uh, responsibility on the COP presidency, at the same time being a member of the cabinet. This means that he has access to the political leadership of the UK government as the host country. So this is one of the most important updates. We have also have seen that there's a full list of the, the team of the UK presidency. And there we see, in addition to Alok Sharma, we have continuously been highlighting Nigel Champion, Nigel Topping as the champion, Mark Carney. Uh, but we also now see Anne-Marie Travellian in, in terms of adaptation. And uh, the, the UK presidency also assigned a number of regional ambassadors from Latin America to Africa to, to Asia. And they're also part of the process. They have a diverse uh, engagement team as well. In addition to this core team, uh, the UK COP26 presidents have also been, um, let's say, um, operationalizing a number of councils which are uh, serving to the presidency to, in terms of developing their policies. The most important one is the Friends of COP that is being established in, I think, May in 2020. In this group, uh, we have uh, a representative from our community, local and regional and that is Eric Carcetti, my mayor of Los Angeles and C40 chair. Uh, we have a number of other councils. Um, I, in my capacity as LGM at Focal Point, I'm also serving in the Civil Society and Youth Advisory Council, knowing that I'm neither young nor member of the Civil Society as ICTE, but 
it is always good to to engage with the presidency and the partners share our experiences and also uh, enrich our preparations um, other councils uh, include for example these two are the most uh, directly relevant for the uk stakeholders the one is the devolved administration ministerial advisory council that refers to the uh, the domestic arrangements within the uk which is engaging scotland northern ireland wales um, and england uh, uh, the other one is uh, representative of cities and regions, um, which is uh, metropolitan regions or, or uh, metropolitan governments, uh, their mayors and their presidents of the regions. Uh, and they also have now an advisory council so that they are meeting regularly with the UK Cultural Presidency. Uh, among all those, we are also continuously uh, interacting with the Cultural Five President uh, from Chile, Ms. Carolina Schmidt, uh, as well as Mr. Gonzalo Munoz as the high level champion. Um, in terms of our, our agenda towards COP26, uh, we may recall uh, when, when we left uh, Madrid, we have announced our vision that we want to make COP26 in Glasgow as the multi-level action COP. That is trying to reflect the true spirit of the Paris Agreement that is acknowledging engagement of role of all levels of government. Um, every year, climate process has been uh, going through their own agenda, so we are participating through the various uh, initiatives or, or processes like showcasing and consultations and decision making, and presidencies also have their own agendas. In the case of UK, we have five agendas, and our seven pillars of the multi-level action copies, in fact, trying to make the bridge uh, or making ourselves relevant to the upcoming agendas, both officially in the UNFCC process, but the initiatives that the presidency will develop. Um, and in the next slide, I will try to make a, a summary in one slide, let's say, about what we have achieved over the, the past 12 months uh, uh, since the 2020 started. Um, we can have a first look at in terms of the milestones that we have gone through over these uh, months. Uh, obviously, the first couple of months, we were like all the members of our constituency, like all, all the uh, constituencies of the world of stakeholders, we were trying to adjust ourselves to the new reality of lockdowns um, and uh, trying to understand how we can deal with the COVID-19 pandemic conditions. Uh, but in a couple of months, uh, thanks to the connectedness of local and regional governments through various networks like global task force or, or, or global uh, processes like LGMA, and also the technological effort to, efforts, we started to soon recover the first shock and we started to make uh, more regular engagements. And our most important, uh, let's say, the first kickoff was the our dialogue of the champions, Nigel Topping and Gonzalo Munoz in May. This was a, the opportunity for us to interact with them. We immediately continued with a ministerial mayoral dialogue in, on the 28th of May, held by the three UN agencies, UNDP, UN Environment, and, and UN Habitat, uh, hosted by ICLE, Global Covenant, and UCLG. On the 5th of June, we contributed to the Race to Zero initiative. We will go that, take a look at that as well, separately. Um, in August, uh, our, our partners in the Latin American region hosted under the leadership of uh, C35, second uh, local environmental authorities uh, environment forum, uh, in, and which uh, concluded with the Santiago Declaration, which revealed an ambitious roadmap towards Glasgow. In September, we contributed to the redesign uh, summit of the Japanese government and UNFCC in terms of uh, relating to the COVID-19 response, recovery, and the new concept of redesign. We participated also in the UN 75 and the UN Biodiversity Summit in New York. Um, almost October was very busy for us. We had the full urban October uh, in which, which for us, we began with the Mannheim Conference of European uh, Cities and Regions, which concluded with uh, a Mannheim message that is aiming for a localization of the European Green Deals. Uh, on the Daring Cities, we had for three weeks uh, a discussion with uh, urban leaders on dealing with climate emergency with the perspective of no act lead. Uh, in November, we were in Africa with Kigali, Ikle Africa, uh, Commonwealth of Mayors of Saharan Africa, the Rwanda, local, uh, the, Rwanda, the Rwanda national government. That was also a mobilization at the regional level again in Africa. Um, we contributed in the Race to Zero Dialogue of the Champions uh, with a special uh, focus on cities and regions there on the 18th of November, but also we have released uh, a number of uh, announcements there. Um, the UNFCC changed its its scope 
um, of engagement so that they have opened a new platform for um, a dialogue uh, without any negotiations, but covering all the uh, agendas on, at stake. And there at the Climate Dialogues, LGMA were, were, was very active. We have participated through opening and closing interventions, presidents of dialogue, and we also hosted the side event as ICLE and Climate Chance. Um, and the rest of December, we were very busy to contribute or strengthen the efforts for the celebration of the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. That also started with an event in the UK, our partner UK100 released or read, announced their roadmap uh, at the Paris City Hall, uh, Mayor of Paris hosted the Zero Carbon Forum, which also concluded with Paris Declaration. And at the 12th of December, the Am Climate Ambition Summit, uh, LGMA was very visible in the live session. Uh, C40 uh, was interacting uh, with, uh, with the recorded message, but on the on video section, of the Climate Ambition Summit, you can find a number of entries like a one and a half minutes video of LGMA. ICLE has a, has a five minutes video, uh, as well as an announcement on the Transformative Actions Program. And a number of other partners like Under Two Coalition uh, and others also have been participating in the, uh, the, the Climate Ambition Summit through their uh, on-demand videos. Um, so over these uh, milestones, uh, what we have, achieved uh, in terms of substance of our work. Uh, first of all, let's recall at the beginning of the year, we were focusing in a, a roadmap that had six elements, but throughout these, uh, all the events that you have been hearing from Santiago to Kigali, from Mannheim to Bonn, uh, we were delighted and honored to have the, the strong engagement and leadership of Glasgow. Um, leader of the Glasgow City Council, Susan Aitken was uh, always with us, she contributed in the discussions and she was continuously referring that climate justice will be a legacy that Glasgow wants to achieve at the end of COP when they are hosting it as the host city. That spoke uh, to the heart of many of our members earlier in the year. Um, there was a joint uh, message from the GCOM and Global Task Force to address the climate justice. And in the Marrakesh Partnership Human Settlements Pathway, we also have a session on section on waste and consumption, which addressed the social in inequities or um, social inequities. Therefore, we fully uh, uh, embraced this call from Glasgow. Therefore, we have introduced the seventh pillar as our, our uh, as the final, let's say, at least as of today, uh, element of our, our, our roadmap. And meanwhile, earlier in the beginning, uh, this was uh, an idea, but we have created a, a working group and the logos in this bottom, all the networks or the partners, they have committed to support this process um, by providing inputs to the six or seven now agendas, uh, both in terms of substance, but also in terms of introducing new ideas and, and dealing these with their own events. And obviously last year, because of the, 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 the new situations during to COVID and the, the postponement of the processes, um, we did not make too much uh, operationalize uh, the, the working group of the LGMA roadmap, but now that we have much more clarification in the agenda, which we'll go through in a moment, we would hope that the partners involved in the roadmap working group would be much more actively involved. So uh, let's recap now what we have achieved all these seven areas. Raising ambition was particularly uh, an element that uh, we have made serious progress. Um, and uh, this uh, this um, obviously was a result of all the efforts with the champions in Chile and the UK uh, champions as well. In fact, local governments have been ad committing to climate ambition for a long while. Uh, they were adopting climate emergency declarations, announcing climate emergencies, but now it is part of the big machinery of the race to zero. Uh, and now uh, by the end of December, we have been noticing that more than 500 cities and regions have already announced their climate neutrality goals. And now the, 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 the mission of Race to Zero is to make sure that they follow transparency. And in particular, they strengthen their 2050 targets by introducing 2030 midterm targets. Obviously, it takes time for local governments to adopt such um, binding commitments. It goes through council decisions and administrations, but we hope over the next couple of months, the global mobilization will help us to move forward and that the, the, the campaign will eventually result in around 1,000 cities who have both climate potential targets for 2050, but also very strong uh, midterm targets towards 2030 as well and supported with transparency, which is 
the four minimum criteria pledge, publish, proceed, and uh, no, pledge, plan, proceed, and publish. Uh, at the end of December, uh, we also have seen from the champions that a new campaign is launched, Race to Z Resilience. This was uh, trying to address the concerns on the adaptation uh, and, and dealing with nature and health. Um, therefore, um, more information about this will be a, a new announced in the upcoming climate adaptation summit, but we already know that there will be strong emphasis to the urban component of this as well. In the NDC vertical integration, what we have achieved is that, first of all, we were particularly impressed with, with a number of countries who announced their uh, NDCs, Chile and Rwanda, among those who are more pro prominent in terms of to deliver uh, the, the, the notion of multi-level uh, collaboration, we of course would like to make it much better, but their starting point was already very, very impressive. Uh, we also have heard from countries like um, China, sorry, um, Japan and South Korea, who have committed for climate and shelter because they had so many local and regional governments announcing their climate and shelter targets. So we hope Japan and South Korea, and this will also be demonstrating how this will be turned into from policy to practice in terms of the official plans. In, in fact, South Korea have already started by uh, presenting an updated NDC where they refer to this uh, strong element of cities in their new plan. And we hope in the next couple of months, we will be working with Korea and Japan and others to, to integrate ambitions of local governments into their national policies. And we are working with GCOM on the regional and local determined contributions. Um, the, the work that the EU will be developing will be important in that sense. The climate pact and the evolution of the climate law in the mid-year will be important, but we have already started to work on that. Um, EU has always been a champion of integrating local governments, especially uh, the, the vision of, of, of collaboration, but we hope with this new momentum, we will also see how the commitments, especially climate and social target of cities and regions are helping ambitious national targets as well. There are initiatives like Partnership for Collaborative Climate Action and the UNFCC Friends of Multi-Level Action. We would, we have worked a lot. There have been some publications, but especially with the U.S. government coming on board into the Paris Agreement starting from tomorrow onwards, we believe this group of Friends of Multi-Level Action will be much more stronger as well. But we're very happy that this group is alive and that that will be barking with us, especially when you see those national governments who have already uh, inter incorporated local energy governments into their processes. Uh, in terms of climate finance, um, the, the, the issue uh, is that we are having good news. The, the, the GAP fund that was announced in the UN Climate Summit in 2019 is now operational. This means that our project facilities, project preparatory facilities, um, have now much more resources and, and uh, opportunities to serve to our uh, members uh, so that their plans could be much better prepared and they can be connected to the global and national finance institutions. Meanwhile, we are we have mapped that we have more than 68 cities and, and regions who have divested. Uh, the latest example was the state of New York, uh, and C40 also announced the mayor's declaration. So these are new elements that we are considering in the climate finance discussions. Um, obviously, there were a halt in the negotiations of Article 6, but we hope this will come up soon. Uh, we are. We have started to focus on a balanced approach between mitigation and adaptation. This became much more relevant in the COVID-19 process because the reaction or response, recovery and redesign of climate or, or redesign on the COVID-19 pandemic had to be connected to the climate policies, therefore, so that we can both have uh, more ambitious actions, but also be much better uh, transforming and leapfrogging our, our development paradigm uh, both in the north and in the south, uh, through this uh, crisis, which can turn into an opportunity. I think that was a nice um, way for us to combine these two. We are in, excited with the UN Secretary General's policy brief, so we would like to in, invest more in this year as well on that. Um, on the specific elements of mitigation, for example, in the transport sector, we have a, a new list of eight policies for principles for ecologistics, especially a, a, an important source of emissions in the urban centers the logistics uh, vehicles and, and processes. On the renewable energy side, we have more than 300 cities who have announced their commitments that will be also helping us to accelerate our uh, climate natural goals. Um, we had also the fifth element of circular economy and nature. The, the good news, especially in the Marrakesh partnership, 
the human settlements pathway has a much strong vision on waste and consumption uh, as part of this effort. So we believe, especially connecting circular economy uh, with, with innovative financing and a holistic approach to our material use, it will be easier to address uh, new policies and commitments on climate neutrality much earlier than 2050. Um, we are also in the nature of perspectives. We were expecting that there will be a super year uh, throughout this year, we have been enjoying the leadership of Edinburgh, Scottish government, uh, which concluded with Edinburgh Declaration of Subnational Governments, and we have also provided inputs to, to the UN Biodiversity Summit. So we are hopeful these will now give us the necessary evidence that we can have a better connection between nature and climate as an outcome of this year's in 2020 uh, Biodiversity COP and Climate COP. In terms of our sixth element, amplifying the global action, we were hoping that we would be achieving an urbanization ministerial for the first time. Uh, this was a logic that every COP, we have ministers of environment, ministers of trade, finance, um, but we have other ministers and urbanization is one of those. There are several national governments who have ministers of urbanization or public housing or public works. We believe their presence at the COP would also help us to encourage local and encourage national governments to bring uh, an urban investment or urban action or local investment closer to the climate policies. Um, we are still committed to that. We are also excited that you inhabit that will also be uh, kicking off an ambitious uh, agenda uh, for campaigns. We hope this would be part of their process as well. And knowing that in the UK, we also have a ministers of housing. I think this will be an opportunity. We will be still working on the UN 75 discussions uh, as part of the UN development reform. Uh, we have provided, provided inputs through global task force on this process. One important element of, of diversify, diversification of climate actors is the collaboration of the urban community with arts, cultural heritage community. Over this past month, we have enjoyed the collaboration with Climate Heritage Network. Uh, we have hosted even in the World Urban Forum in Abu Dhabi, uh, a focusing on culture. We are saying that we are we have to develop a culture of sustainable life. We have to develop a culture of 1.5 degree living. Therefore, uh, contributions from ministers of culture, arts, education, youth, they all are important in our efforts. In that sense, we'll also connect. Uh, we have made some initial in interactions with the UNFCC communities on uh, Article 6 and Article 12 of the Paris Agreement, which addresses public awareness, education, training. Um, so we will be acting on that in the next couple of months as well. So as you can see, for the 12 months, it is a pretty ambitious outcome, but now it's time to feed it and much more ambitiously, both to the national process, but also towards our, our COP26 preparation. So in this regard, let me take you through our expected agenda for this year over the next 12 months. The most important point we have to address is that um, we are aware that COVID-19 pandemic is not over. From across the world, we are seeing that, yes, it is good that we have vaccination started, but obviously not every country and not every community has access to the vaccines. And um, lockdowns are intensifying in a number of countries around the world. And under these conditions, yes, there are several events like sports events are continuing, even though without uh, audience. This means that there are still international travels. But if we think about thousands or even tens of thousands of audience or participants or delegations, in the past for the COPs, it is unrealistic to expect this kind of a thing will happen. Uh, meanwhile, we are also aware throughout the past months, thanks to the technology and interconnectedness, the, the global community and all the partners have learned how to interact through virtual platforms. Um, and, and I think they have a lot of experience now. The thing that they don't have at the moment is how to agree on intergovernmental decisions through virtual platforms. There are several challenges, time zones, uh, accessibility of all partners, even though we are aware that virtual platforms are giving more access to, especially for those from developing countries who have access to internet without necessarily going through visa or without necessarily going to costly travels, they can interact with a lot of stakeholders. So we are seeing that local regional governments are enjoying virtual connectiveness or virtual platforms. However, the negotiations are still not enabling us in the, the true sense. While uh, being aware of it, we are also aware that there is a huge progress in that. So it's not impossible to expect a, a, a scenario where 
there can be a combination of both a limited physical meeting but also a large audience. So uh, there would be several announcements coming up from the host of the, 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 those processes. Uh, therefore, when you read those um, calendars, the point you have to, or we have to be aware is the definition of the event we're talking about. If it is uh, referring to a official negotiation session, like subsidiary Mardi meeting or a conference of parties, be aware, it is still not clear whether this will happen as physical. Um, it is also not clear whether they will be in the virtual, but these events are still um, having uh, some, some elements of maneuver in terms of the way they will be coming. Therefore, the, in this chart, you see in italics SB52 in June and Climate COP in, in, in November is in, in, a, in, a, in, in an important, uh, let's say, point of caveat about format. Uh, whereas all the other events, what you have seen here, it is possible to expect that all of them is uh, possible to be held virtually. For all these meetings that you would see in this and many others to come, you don't need to travel. Uh, of course, seeing each other would still be very nice, but it is possible that these events can take place. We have seen this in the past months and we would expect that this can happen this year as well. Therefore, we are expecting all these events will be organized all virtual uh, and when it comes to negotiations in June and in November, we should still wait for some updates. So having this in mind, this year we'll start in January with the Climate Adaptation Summit in Rotterdam next week. Uh, on Monday, we will expect to hear announcements, especially on the new Race to Resilience. Um, obviously, tomorrow's inauguration of uh, Biden and Harris as the President, Mr. Joe Biden and Ms. Ms. Kamala Harris as the President and Vice President of the US uh, 46th uh, Presidency will be important because they have already committed that the day after they will bring US to Paris Agreement. Uh, that is uh, particularly exciting for all of us. Um, on the February, um, our key event is the, the UN and Ramda Assembly fifth session, which is split into two, as you have seen, the UN and Ramda already have adopted itself to this new reality. This was presumably be an in-house in-person in meeting, but now they have made an interim solution so that in February 2021, they will have a virtual meeting where they will discuss on their budgets or, or medium-term strategy, but the substance or the thematic work on nature and nature-based solutions will be discussed next, next year. In March, uh, a number of things will come up. First of all, uh, the UK COP26 presidency will focus on um, an event. Uh, it will not be as Climate Ambition Summit, which means it will not be heads of state level, but it will be at the ministerial level, uh, a climate and development event. This is particularly aiming to, uh, because in the December in Climate and Ambition Summit, they managed to create a momentum for new commitments for uh, the national commitments. Um, there are more countries who have announced their commitments and there we're looking forward to the more to come, but still, the support from the north to the south, and especially to address vulnerable communities is still an issue. The adaptation is still an important area. So that climate and development event in March will particularly have a focus on that and we look forward to this further update from the COP26 presidency in terms of how we will be able to engage um, as our constituency into this process. But we have already uh, shared our, our vision that uh, this is an agenda that speaks to the heart of our constituency and members of local and governments. From a non-UN perspective, uh, or let's say from non-UN FCC perspective, I have to correct, we are expecting an ambitious event led by Japanese Minister of Environment. In particular, personally, Minister Koizumi is very, very committed to accelerate the, the net zero journey of cities and prefectures in Japan. In, this, in, in October last year at the Daring Cities Conference or Forum, he announced that Japan will host an international forum and it is now announced that this will be on the 17th and 18th March of the year virtually, but we will be hoping that this will be an opportunity for us to accelerate our race to zero, to accelerate our multi-level indices. Therefore, we are look excited to, to make the best use of this. Um, ICLE will be one of the partners. Uh, this will be primarily led by Minister of Environment of Japan and IGES, but UNFCC will also be invited and other partners will also be invited. And the champions are also invited as a core partner to this process. April will be particularly busy uh, because we know it is the 22nd of April, uh, a milestone, which is the, the Earth Day. 
Uh, it has always been important because of the, the massive uh, grassroots mobilization for the past 50 years. Um, and it was always an opportunity for making new announcements. We know it was the, the day when the Paris Agreement was open for signature. Therefore, this is also uh, an opportunity to raise any commitments or updates on Paris Agreement implementation. But the days this year will be also very important because it will overlap with the first 100 days of the US um, Biden-Harris administration. Therefore, on the, around 22nd 20, of April, we're expecting a number of events or announcements. In New York, the president of the UN General Assembly will host a, a specific event on desertification. And in April, also in May, we could expect a number of workshops can continue. Um, in May or around May, we are expecting the, some of the regional climate weeks can take place. Uh, we may expect climate action pathways under the Marrakesh partnership could be updated or uh, re re revealed in, in a much uh, ambitious or let's say with additional endorsements. At the national level, we have an important agenda in the UK and Scotland. There will be uh, municipal elections in England, uh, Northern Ireland and Wales. And uh, in Scotland, there will be parliamentary elections for the Scottish Parliament. All will happen on the same day, 6th of May. It will, of course, not be direct impact to the COP26 presidency, but still a domestic agenda, political agenda is important. We could expect, for example, through this municipal election campaigns, more cities in the UK and Scotland could come up with more ambitious targets for 2030 and 2050 climate neutrality goals, or additional announcements or actions could be developed. Um, in May, we will also uh, see the, the, the International Day for Biodiversity, which will also be an opportunity for the, uh, the, uh, the, to make use of the momentum of the, the Super Year for Nature. In June, as we said, we are expecting announcements from the UNFCC, German government, whether there will be an in-person in SB52. From ICLEA's side, we are expecting that it will not happen. It may be similar like the one we had in November at Global Dialogues, which is fully virtual, but without negotiations. But maybe they may have some taken lessons learned, or you may, they may have improved their infrastructure so that in this bond dialogues, maybe they may have even some negotiations uh, or agreeing on some decisions that may even help to prepare better the, the COP in, in Glasgow in November. Um, in June, uh, usually we do not consider G7 and G20 as part of the UNFCC agenda. It is a separate, it's not a UN process. However, this year it is very unique because G7 is led by Italy and G20 is led by UK, which are the, the presidents and hosts of COP26. Therefore, we are expecting uh, a much more integration or much more synergies between the UNFCC agenda and G7 and G20 agenda. The G7 summit is already announced on the 11th to 13th of June at Cornwall, uh, the southwest uh, of, of the UK. And we are aware Commonwealth uh, heads of states will also meet in Rwanda or with the host of the Rwanda national government. Um, so there will definitely be a synergy between these two events. Meanwhile, in June, uh, there will be a number of in, um, in observers like 5th of June, World Environment Day, and 17th of June, the Desertification Day. Uh, around 15th of, 5th of June, there will be uh, celebrations of the launch of the Decade for Ecosystem Restoration by UNEP Environment, UN Environment and the partners. Uh, and in June, we're also expecting uh, more progress in the EU, EU, EU climate law, which is hopefully integrating the EU indices, but also um, climate pact and the contribution of citizens and also local and regional governments. Uh, in June, we are also expecting the Urban 20 will be hosted in by, by Milan and in support of Rome. Um, that is always an opportunity for us to influence the global agenda. Uh, over the past, we have seen ambitious outcomes from Buenos Aires, from Tokyo and Riyadh, uh, but we are expecting in 2021, it will be even more ambitious because of the, the vision of G7 and G20 and, and the fact that uh, US is also part of this process. Uh, therefore, stay tuned for updates from our partners, C14 and UCLG, who are leading the Urban 20. And we from ICLE side and the LGMA committee will, of course, be ready to support this process. Um, um, in July, 
G20 climate minister will be hosted uh, by Italy. Um, this is important because in the G20 agenda, environment ministers are not always um, coming together. This was the first, the first time held by the Saudi Arabian presidency last year. We are very happy that the, the Italian government is also continuing this practice. Uh, so we look forward to an engagement, active engagement to that process. In July, we will also have in New York, the high level political forum, which will also focus on SDG 13 climate action. Uh, August will be relatively, let's say smooth, therefore we didn't include this year. Um, in September and October, some of those events may be crossing each other, but uh, on the UNFCC side, we will expect to have the pre-COP um, uh, in Italy. Um, we don't know whether the champions would wish to have, like they have in November dialogue, whether they would like the October dialogues. It may be possible because of, in order to reduce stress on the number of participation, physical participation to limit during COP, most of the stakeholders may be encouraged to participate in October sessions, whereas a much little number of people can be in at, at, enabled to access in the practical COP. These are all hypotheses, at, of course, at the moment. But we also know at the end of October, Italy will host the G20 summit, heads of state, 13 and 31st of October. Obviously, the day after climate COP will be starting in, in uh, Glasgow. So we don't know how they will manage to engage heads of state at the Glasgow COP in, when they are already meeting in Rome for the, the G20. So there are still things to be clarified on the way forward, like we guess. And obviously, um, the, the Italian government currently undergoing going through some domestic challenges, we hope they will survive and they will continue to focus on these activities as well. Um, in the UN side in September is always the peak year of the year. It's the General Assembly session at the UN uh, headquarters in New York. This time there will be additional sessions on energy and food system summit will be held. Uh, these will be very important because there are a lot of influences into the climate policies of these sectors. Um, we have an important agenda in Germany. Uh, federal elections will be held in Germany. Uh, uh, there are expectations that there may be a new coalition government with having the Greens being part of the, the coalition by some capacity. Um, it is important because this will be the first time that Greens will be in power after their presence in the leadership on the government in the early 2000s. And if you look at the chronology of climate action, the, the time when the Greens were in power, both Germany and um, the EU was much more actively leading climate uh, action, ambitious climate action. So if, if we see a change in the, 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 the coalition government in Germany, we may expect that there will be immediate impact to the EU policy. But until the, the government coalition is set up, of course, you cannot expect immediate as such. It may take some time. Therefore, we do not expect major changes of the EU or German policies at COP26. But after COP26, maybe, we could expect um, uh, an additional uh, leadership from Germany and EU in and, and that regard. Um, in September, ICLA is planning to host uh, Dang Cities. The dates are still not announced. The duration is still not announced. But we, we want to continue the spirit of Dang Cities. Uh, IUCN, as an important factor, actor, will have their World Congress in, in Marseille. Um, uh, we are expecting the biodiversity COP25, COP15 to be held in Kunming. Officially, it is not announced like this date. They are still. The official website says that it is the first quarter, or sorry, the first half. But realistically speaking, it can only be done in the second half of the year. And obviously, October is always important for us. The urban October is our agenda. We will then in November go to Glasgow. Once again, it is very likely to expect a hybrid arrangement, uh, like limited number of participants, physically present, but huge opportunities of internet engagement and virtuality. We don't know how much we access, what will be the management of the space, how will we abide for the hygiene rules in the side events or pavilions. Therefore, we have to stay tuned for updates from the UK government and Glasgow and Scotland as well. And uh, there is a possibility that we may have a desertification COP in December, but this is still have to be uh, so confirmed by the Secretariat. Our, our last slide, what we are trying to uh, encourage you that this this seven pillars of, of, of our engagement is helpful for us. We have seen how it is helping us to advance, but maybe it may be good to clarify uh, the diversity and 
it may be better to make a differentiation between what the outcome of each process. So in that sense, we would like to couple raising ambition and vertical integration of NDCs in a context of Paris Agreement, localization of Paris Agreement, so that Paris Agreement related processes are, are, are grouped together. We would like to continue in this uh, with the new NDCs that we would see more reference to engagement of local and regional governments, and we would like to have more cities and regions committing to race to zero and race to resilience. The rest of the three points, finance, mitigation adaptation, circular economy nature, can be bundled as accelerating climate action. For this, we don't need a new NDCs. There are already ongoing processes, both at the national and other, other processes. Therefore, we can focus on these elements uh, much more actively. In the finance, obviously, we have to focus on Article 6, but now we are aware Green Climate Fund has introduced a new sectoral program for, for cities. Uh, or in, in their hearing, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropy has announced the mayor's challenge, for example, the successful bidders will be receiving uh, six-digit resources. Uh, if we consider that we are just juggling to get uh, hundreds of thousands from, from the global and national funds uh, to the cities, uh, six-digit resources globally uh, from a philanthropy obviously is, is an important game changer. Therefore, we can definitely consider philanthropic uh, support to finance is an important element as well. In the circular economy and nature, maybe we could also include a reference to food and health uh, because that has been a, a huge discussion now. And when it comes to when it comes to expanding climate community, definitely we will work with Glasgow how we can formulate a workable agenda on climate justice and social equity. We would in, in, in intensify our efforts to work with the host government, UK and UN Habitat to envisage a ministerial of urbanization at COP26. We'll see how it can be uh, developed. We will continue to work with our partners from culture community and education in the morning session. We heard Earth Day is now, now rush, reaching, ratcheting up a, an important agenda on education. Um, the ACE agenda is the best place for that. And we are very happy that our roadmap also envisages uh, some relevances to that. And many local governments have been either through curriculum or outside curriculum also working on education. Therefore, we as local governments can contribute a lot. And the last uh, now section that should come, I guess, is that last year we didn't focus on it, but now, now we're getting closer to the summit. Um, we have to now consider in which events we will have, uh, which type of engagement, will we have a side event, will we have a pavilion, we will have thematic days, we will have summits. This will be a COP26, pre-COP, G20, and G7 summits. Obviously, both the scope and the, the workload is huge. Therefore, it's also possible that not all of us can be or have to be present everywhere. Definitely, the host countries and their partners and cities and regions will be playing a huge role there. But uh, we have to have a mapping of it. Therefore, uh, a reloading of all these vision and the reactivation of the roadmap of the working group of the COP26 president, the COP26 LGMA constituency is essential. So in the next couple of weeks, we will work with all of you. I uh, hope to bring more elements. Um, I think this concludes my intervention. I know it was a bit longer than expected, um, but now I'd like to open the floor for inputs, questions, remarks, um, clarifications. You can raise your hand or type in the Q&A box or chat box. Um, I already see uh, Mayor Manuel Arojo, uh, Mayor of Kalimane and ICLE, uh, Chair of ICLE Africa, and also ICLE Global Executive Committee member. He has uh, already typed in that he, he is very much supportive of the seventh pillar, which is climate justice and social equity. We are delighted to hear his support as well, and we look forward to his contributions. Any other, other uh, contributions now, feel free to type in or uh, Raise your hands. Uh, Shnezana, are you able to see any uh, colleagues who have raised their hands? We can give the floor if, if, if possible. Yeah, I will um, give the floor to them, no problem. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so um, feel free to make the best use of the time in the next couple of minutes. Um, we know due to the some um, uh, communication problems, some of you are registered as Matteo Bizotti, Bisotto, uh, Matteo is our uh, colleague in the uh, ICLE communications department who's managing our uh, calendar of webinars. 
so there was a confusion from my side. I'm, I apologize for that. But if you are announced as Matteo Bisotto, please, when you type in your question or when you raise your hands, please indicate your real name so that we are aware that you are not Matteo for sure, but we should be aware of who you are while reading your question or hearing your interventions. I don't see too much hands raised. Um, um, that's fine. We can also cut that session short. We are just, just 10 minutes left to the hour. Um, but any announcements are, are also welcome if needed. Um, so we have an input from um, in the question and answer box from Juliette Thies. Can you come back to the divest and Article 6 of the finance subsection? Definitely. Um, let me bring that one again. Maybe this could be the place where we can stay there. Uh, we have input from Emilia, uh, Emily from FMDV. FMD will be happy to contribute to Priority Area 3, localized climate finance. Please let us know the data of the next working group on finance. Definitely, Emilia, thanks a lot for your contribution. Again, on the, I mean, the, these two questions, uh, Juliet, I don't know uh, which organization are you from or which representation are you here. Uh, you can also help us to, to recall your, your position and, and, and organization. But on the divestment, uh, what we know, there is a momentum over the past few years. Uh, the first city who announced a divestment was our member, ICLE member, uh, Donadin. Uh, from New Zealand, over the years, this um, move, this turned into a really ambitious movement. A number of cities in Europe also have, have elevated this. But most important thing, uh, most important announcement came from New York City. Um, in 2019, New York City announced that they are divesting. It's in the order of billions. Obviously, the resources from <laughs> um, Dunedin and New York City are slightly scalable. Um, therefore, uh, New York City was the not was not the first city, but it had created a huge impact to the announcement or awareness around divestment. And now we have known that around 68 cities or local and regional governments in the world have made a commitment for divestment. And as we said, the latest example is the New York State. Um, we believe this is an important vehicle that local and regional governments can, can, can use. Obviously, not all the uh, local and regional governments can have this authority in terms of using their pension funds or other investments, but there will always be uh, opportunities. We know uh, there is a case study developed by ICLE US for the case of New York City. C40 has a guide on divesting and investing, and climate natural framework ICLE also addresses divestments as an important element. So during this month, uh, we would like to work more uh, and we would like to engage our colleagues from New York City or other cities who have made divest means uh, have an ambitious agenda of their climate and social goals. So maybe we can have another session with them. Uh, in terms of Article 6, uh, this is the agenda which is not concluded at COP26, sorry, COP24 in Katowice in 2018, which means market-based, which is TDM, flexibility me mechanisms, emissions trading, the rules under the Paris Agreement are not defined yet. Um, but the Article 6 is not only the market mechanism. There's also a phrase called non-market mechanism. And in fact, we are also advocating for a while the sustainable urban development as a policy, as a planning, uh, can also be interpreted as a non-market mechanism because by defining an urban trajectory, by defining your uh, the new investments in, in, in uh, the built environment, your, your, uh, your, your investments to your new developments in the urban space already also box you into a low carbon or a high carbon trajectory. Therefore, if we can formulate that uh, sustainable urban policies, the new developments, the urbanization programs could be a non-market mechanism. I think that would introduce a huge, huge opportunity for local governments across the world, local Asian governments. And it could be a good opportunity to be convincing national governments to be committing to climate neutrality because both the existing cities and the new cities that will be developed, especially in the South, if they make it that this is not business as usual, but low carbon, uh, then they can already meet Paris Agreement quite easily as well. So that's the logic. We're happy to discuss with you. Uh, we were happy to hear 
your inputs, uh, how you want to contribute into this. Josephine is from ICLA European Secretariat, who is working on the uh, procurement uh, program as well. Um, uh, it's it's the, the question is um, what is the recommendation lead up to COP26? Join forces, uh, collaborate with towards uh, side sessions. I mean, we are already in touch uh, with both presidency, Scottish government, and Glasgow, to make sure we have presence in the blue zone, the green zone, and the Glasgow chamber halls. Obviously, we are expecting an, a call from the UK presidency. How will they manage this mobilization? With Glasgow or Scottish government, we are exploring the opportunities. Depending on how the, the physical space will be shaped, obviously our, our mobilization will also shape. So I think we should be stay tuned for some updates in the next couple of weeks. Um, we are expecting them to announce some some more concrete uh, plans in the soon. Um, but definitely, since you're referring to the procurement, I think in the mitigation adaptation circular economy, we definitely have to consider that procurement power of local energy governments could be an important factor to help them reach climate neutrality goals. And this should be much more visible. We're very happy that in the Marrakesh Partnership of Human Settlements, we have a waste and consumption subgroup. We should use this as the place to promote sustainable procurement. And this is also the time for us to bring that, that as a contribution to climate neutrality goals. So we look forward to your and your leadership as, as well. So. A uh, lot of homework to do. I don't see additional comments or questions, and we are just four more minutes left, which is good for us that we can uh, comfortably go to the next agendas. Um, through this opportunity, I'd like to once again thank you all. I also would like to, I forgot that once again, because of the focus to the agenda, I forgot to celebrate your or wish you all a nice, uh, happy and healthy 2021. Um, hoping that um, this will be a year where we will be able to uh, take lessons from our experience from 2020 in terms of pandemic, but use this and, and turn this into an opportunity to accelerate our transformative climate action towards um, a better future uh, for our and, and current generations and future generations as well. So we want uh, 20 one will be the year to be accelerating uh, for our efforts, um, hoping that we will we will reduce our losses from pandemic. We will be much better be able to be equipped with dealing with the pandemic and that we will be able to focus on redesign, recovery and climate action plans. With that in mind, uh, we'd like to encourage you to stay tuned for updates from LGMA mailing list because uh, the calendar of webinars in the next couple of months will be announced soon. T -t Traditionally, we would like to keep it every third Wednesday. And uh, this month in January, we deliberately wanted to change because tomorrow we are aware our colleagues in the US will be exciting uh, and, and very, very, let's say, wholeheartedly waiting for the inauguration of uh, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, who would bring US back into the Paris Agreement. So we didn't want to disturb their celebrations. We didn't want to disturb their um, uh, mobilization. Therefore, we want to have this webinar on Tuesday. But to the extent possible, we want to keep every third Wednesday is the moment for our webinar. So uh, stay tuned and more updates to come. Uh, we look forward to uh, collaborating with you and in, in case you have any updates from your side, feel free to send us. Uh, feel free to visit our website. We are keeping the competency website of the cities and regions. That is the landing page of the, the, the LGMA constituency. And you can also visit a number of um, links over this um, uh, pages um, and we will keep you updated. Thank you very much and have a nice day and have a nice evening wherever you are.